test, test one, two, testing one, two, two, three. Uh, oh.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Nora Silver. I'm a faculty member here at Haas, and I'm the director of the Center for Nonprofit and Public Leadership. And it's my privilege to welcome you here to the Center's first Impact Speaker Series event of this year. This is our 20th event. Uh, since 2009, we've gathered 1,500 people from all walks of life to look at issues involving social impact. For the students that are here, we have an upcoming event, our second event. We'll look at social impact consulting. We'll have a panel of consultants talking to you about what a career in social impact consulting would be like. That's November 13th, 4 p.m. Here at Haas, and in particular at the center, we're about nurturing a new kind of business leader. We're about equipping a new generation of cross-sector leaders with the practical skills to tackle complex social challenges and to create impact. One example I'll give you. Here tonight we have a group of students from a new course just five weeks in called Real World Impact Investing, the $100,000 challenge. Will you raise your hands? Okay, woo! Okay. Each year, this class will take on investing a real $100,000 on different issues. This year, these students will be investing in global education in the developing world. As a side note for who these students are, yes, they're MBA, they're MBA students. But over 30% of the class of students this year have either been educated themselves or their parents were educated in the developing world, which introduces a real-world experience into their analysis and is probably unique among top business schools. I'm really privileged to be here at Berkeley and a, a faculty member at Haas, where we de develop a certain kind of leader, a leader who's innovative, who challenges the status quo, we're Berkeley after all, leaders who are collaborative and give back beyond themselves. We're here to develop leaders who can act and leaders who care deeply, leaders who have confidence and who have courage, and also leaders who think and act globally while, as my father used to preach, never forget where they came from. Leaders who seek a social as well as financial impact. And here with us are our honored guests and other Haas students, 79% of whom did something in this center having to do with social impact last year, and whose colleagues, other business students around the country, rated Haas number one in social impact. We're proud of that. Our students are the future leaders of conscience and of commitment. Mr. Kartwari is such a leader leading a leading company through major change, speaking out for those who are displaced in the world. He's the kind of leader we all aspire to be. And he's here to share his experience and his perspective for no other reason than his generosity and our mutual friend and colleague who is very convincing. Mr. Katwari agrees. <laughs> Dr. Angana Chatterjee is here to introduce Mr. Katwari. Dr. Chatterjee is an anthropologist and co-chair of a research project at the center, a research project to protect people's rights in situations of internal armed conflict. She's working in India to develop frameworks of accountability and of restitution to address humanitarian considerations, including women's health, education technology, and social enterprise, to build capacity for leadership among affected c communities, and to work across sectors with a commitment to nonviolence. We met Mr. Katwari through this research, and so it is fitting that its co-chair, Angana Chaudhary, introduce Mr. Katwari. Angana. It's my privilege to be here, and I would like to thank Dr. Silva, Nora, for her hospitality in instituting the project at the center, and my colleagues, Dr. Shashi Buluswar and Malika Kaur, and myself, 
We are so proud to be here and to be doing this work. Farooq Katwari is the chairman, president, and chief executive officer of Ethan Allen Interiors. A decorated leader and dedicated humanitarian, Mr. Katwari is an entrepreneur of vision and courage. The fault line of lines of history that tore apart the Indian subcontinent in 1947 and continue to impact India today affected Mr. Katwari at a deep and personal level. He witnessed displacement and political aggression and epic humanitarian crises that helped shape in him a capacity for compassion, endurance, and leadership. Raised in Indian Kashmir and in Pakistan, Mr. Katwari received a BA in English Literature and Political Science from Kashmir University. He came to the United States just over 40 years ago and soon received an MBA in International Marketing from the New York University. Following graduation, Mr. Katwari worked as a financial analyst and chief financial officer at Rothschild Inc. He retained an interest in Kashmir's crafts, beautiful, establishing a joint venture company with Ethan Allen. In 1980, his company merged with Ethan Allen, and Mr. Katwari became a vice president. He has been president of the company since 1985 and chairman and chief executive officer since 1988. Shortly after, he took the company private. Restructuring followed at the firm, and Ethan Allen went public again in 1993. Speaking at the Asia Society in New York recently, Mr. Katwari said, my strategy is crisis creates opportunity. Under Mr. Katwari's leadership, Ethan Allen transformed into a foremost interior design business with a vertically integrated operational model that has enabled its prosperity. Through his conscientious men mentorship and collaborative management style, Ethan Allen has witnessed a spectacular increase in annual sales and built a significant worldwide presence. Mr. Katwari has utilized his proficient understanding of competition in the global market and its implications for the United States to innovate during precarious economic times and in conditions of turmoil to create opportunity and foster growth at home and in emergent market countries. Even as Mr. Katwari expanded Ethan Allen at home and abroad, his successes in business further prompted his involvement in public service. Mr. Katwari's commitment to innovative thinking and practice enables creative responses to difficult challenges. His ability to put forward new directions for leaders in business and diplomacy is matched only by his concern for the lives of those disenfranchised. Farooq Katwari's sustained efforts to create public context for social change have been influential. For those concerned with the everyday realities and structural inequities in South Asia, Mr. Katwari's interventions have been inspiring. His discerning work led to the constitution of the Kashmir Study Group, which he founded in 1996, and chairs. The Kashmir Study Group initiated extensive interactions with regional powers, enabled much needed multilateral dialogue, and developed a plan for abating tension there. In his work with diverse constituencies, the care, intelligence, and quiet generosity with which Mr. Katwari consistently treats people brings differences into dynamic and fruitful relation. Rigor, Curiosity and openness to continual learning condition his public service and business enterprise to enable and enrich humanity. The list of Farooq Katwari's achievements is long. Among them, he is a director and former chair of Refugees International, an advocacy organization that acts on behalf of displaced people and a director of the International Rescue Committee, which responds to humanitarian emergencies globally. Mr. Katwari is a member of the advisory board for the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a director and former chair of the National Retail Federation. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. 
Mr. Katwari's industry and humanitarian acclamations include his induction into the American Furniture Hall of Fame and recognition by the US government as an outstanding American by choice. Mr. Katwari is also the recipient of the Eleanor Roosevelt Val Kill Medal, the National Human Relations Award from the American Jewish Committee, and the Humanitarian Award from the Anti-Defamation League. The UN Association for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has recognized Mr. Katwari for his work in raising awareness of the condition of refugees around the world. Three universities have honored Mr. Katwari, including Tufts University, through its conferral upon him the degree of Doctor of Public Service, honoris causa, in 2012. For Mr. With Mr. Katwari, Memory is never an act of nostalgia, but a springboard for ethical action in the present. He has unique capacity to bring fresh ideas to the table. His emotion in geopolitical events and care for those who have suffered life's worst consequences, be it in Afghanistan or at Sandy Hook, compels him to be that rare leader, a visionary with both feet planted firmly on the ground. His leadership exemplifies global connectedness and energizes a new framework for social leadership that brings together personal passion, humility, global citizenship, and socially conscious entrepreneurship. Mr. Katwari demonstrates that, be, that to be truly successful, global leaders must be attentive to the ways in which their actions impact global communities and invigorate social efforts that may require paradigmatic shifts to have a sustainable and constructive bearing on the world. Such impact requires risk-taking, collaborative envisioning, public service, and a multi-sector approach to problem-solving. Mr. Katwari's life represents the finest possibilities of an American dream. It is with the highest regard and with sincere appreciation. It is with the highest regard and sincere appreciation for his contributions to social enterprise and public life that we welcome Mr. Katwari and invite him to speak. I'm gonna, I mean, this is amazing. Well, Angana, I thought you were going to keep it brief. Uh, that's what we talked about. I mean, you have, give, you have really given the whole speech here. So I think that we are almost done. <laughs> I want to thank you for this, you know, really gracious and very long and detailed introduction to Dr. Nora Silva. And in fact, uh, uh, Angana is the one who convinced me to come here. And then when I was talking to her about my talk, uh, we came to the conclusion, and she suggested it, that um, it should not really be a lecture, but really telling some stories. So we thought that would be the, the right thing to do. And she has already given you lots of background, so I'll try to give you some highlights of some. And she, she sort of also suggested that really talk about some of my background, which you have you really uh, taken a lot of, a lot of, you're very gracious to give all of that information. So what I would do is I would go through the story that you asked me to do about my involvement in these various things. So I will talk through pictorially what I think Angana has graciously talked about and in fact overstated it. I don't, I don't know who you were talking about. <laughs> so with that, I have, this is a sign that a number of my associates from Ethan Allen are here, they will recognize it. It is in my office, which says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Einstein, he said it. Now, we all fall into the trap. Even though I have this in my office, my associates, I discuss with it, but we still tend to do things over and over again, whether it is a business, whether it's we as individuals, nations, leaders, they fall into this trap. So uh, it's like you know, saying that I'm going to lose weight, but keep on eating, not going to happen. So this is something, as a, this means change, it means invention, reinvention, and that really has to be part of our business. Now, as just a little background about, you know, I, I was born in Kashmir, 
an area that was, has been unfortunately torn with conflict, unfortunately because there was, there's no, no need for it, but it just shows the fact that unfortunately, uh, especially the leaders uh, do not spend time uh, fixing problems. I mean, the main job of leaders is to, to end conflicts, not to keep them going. But we were, of course, affected by it. And uh, on the other hand, Kashmir is beautiful. There's great mountains. It has great lakes. It has lots of uh, natural beauty. And uh, let me just take this up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it is a lot of centuries of arts and crafts. Uh, <clears throat> so I grew up in this, this area where it was part of conflict. Our families were Im impacted, but also great natural beauty, arts, literature. So that was part of our heritage. <clears throat> this is my grandfather in the 1940s. He was uh, very much involved with arts and crafts. And in fact, he is in front of his art emporium that he had where he collected arts <clears throat> from Central Asia, China, India and sort of, sort of learned about the question of being art and culture because of a family background. In fact, my father um, on the right there was a lawyer by background, got involved with politics and, um, um, and my grandfather on the side and I, I'm in the middle. So you can see, Angna, that uh, I was always in the middle. This is also in Kashmir. So we were, our family was, as Angana said, torn apart. My mother didn't see two of her children for 10 years. So we lived in the mountains and snow, and you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to, to grow up. But again, conflict became part of our life. It sort of, it gave us an understanding and gave me an understanding that uh, that is very dismotivating to people if you're not treating people right. So that sort of always been part of my culture. The other thing was sports. I was a captain of the cricket team. How many of you here know cricket? Yeah, a number, number of people. Now, the cricket is a great game. I spent most of my time in my school days playing cricket, and I was the captain of the team. And the captain of the team uh, in cricket plays with the team, strategizes with the team, cheers with the team. So all my associates here at Ethan Allen know that they're all members of a cricket team. And in fact, we have over uh, 300 teams at Ethan Allen, and they all know what cricket means, and uh, which is that all of our captains play with the team. They are part of it. They chair, and I've got about you know a number of them here today. So that's that was that's what that's what cricket taught me. And then it was coming to America. I was just turned 21. I ended up in New York. And the shock, had no idea of New York, you know, didn't have the internet and all the information that we have today. The world is small. And my first uh, was, I was told uh, that I had to go into the subway. And it's underground. It was a shock because in Kashmir, if you go underground, you don't come out. So sort of it was, I said, how do you breathe? And, you know, but you learn very fast. So I had a job, as Angana said, I went to school at night at NYU, worked during the days. Uh, but America was a different culture. I was no longer in an area of conflict. I could work, I could do things, which I could. In Kashmir, I was in a conflict. I was in student, um, you know, uh, demonstration, throwing stones. That's what I would have done if I had not left. So I came here, got the opportunity, and in less than two years' time, I bought a Mustang. <laughs> Just think of this, only in America. I was able to work during the days in a small printing company, go to school at night, and pay for my full tuition. Live in Brooklyn apartment, eat food, mostly chicken wings, but it was healthy. <laughs> but the thing is today, students cannot do that. That's a major change. That you cannot today go, go to school, pay for yourself, and live as I was able to do. And then, uh, as Angan also stated, I was able to get a uh, I was studying marketing, but our NY, New York University's business school was near Wall Street, so I convinced them that I'm a financial analyst, although I was studying marketing, got a job. And uh, my grandfather in Kashmir sent me 12 wicker baskets and said, sell them and send us the money. Well, that got me into business. And 
I also was, I mean, over the years, I've been very lucky uh, of having a great family. And also, I want to show you this because, you know, you have great weather here, but you don't have these colors. <laughs> I mean, when coming here, this is, I was, what, 32 years back, we bought a farm. It's, um, <clears throat> thanks very much. It's apple orchards, and uh, it's been a great, great, great thing for our family. And uh, that's where we spend most of our time and has given us a balance uh, which really great uh, nature does. Because in Kashmir, there are a lot of apples, so great nature. So I, was, I do some work too on the farm, so he didn't think that I'm a worker. So I was in the farm and, no, this is something that I just got for Sophia here. She is living here in San Francisco and she was most probably sitting in that Jeep somewhere. Sophia, do you remember sitting in the Jeep? So when I saw this, I said, I've got to get it. Sophia is here, she's attending this. She's very, she grew up with our children and our family. And I'm glad to see you here. So I thought this would remind you of the Jeep. But I've got also great friends. This was one of our friends, his name was Tass. And now this is the one who really is my, is my boss. Her name is Pashmina. And now Sophia, of course, when she, was, she came to her house recently, she said, I want to see Pashmina. That was the first thing she did. And uh, so then in the 1970s, I was able to, I, was able, I met the chairman of Ethan Allen and uh, sort of convinced him that he should have a partnership with me. I was in my 20s, I got pretty old. And, I, and he agreed, and then with two my associates, they're Italians, it's in Florence, we set up a company, I mean, I set up a company, they also joined to develop products for Ethan Allen. It's traveled all over the world, from India to, uh, to Italy, and then China, this is in India, I was inspecting rugs. And, you know, I had, I was just to make a point, I had a shotgun. So that I made, made sure. <laughs> the message was, make sure the quality is right. Can you understand? <laughs> yeah, okay. Ethan Allen is a, you know, the great iconic American company. It was established in 1932 and one of the founders, Nat and Sell, he's there. He's the one somehow, you know, took me under his wing and asked me and to get involved and then, then finally he wanted me to merge the, the, merge the company with Ethan Allen and I asked him, why me? I said, I'm, I like what I'm doing. He said, well, if I do this, what would you like to do? I said, I don't want to come here, but if you want it, then I have to take your job. He was shocked, but I did to take his job. And it's a great enterprise. It's, uh, it was founded on great principles, started in Vermont, and um, had an opportunity in the, this in the 80s to get involved in, uh, in starting the transformation. Because every, 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 every entity, organization, nation needs reinvention. And, and what's happened is that the cycle of reinvention is becoming shorter and shorter. In the 1980s, <clears throat> when we started the reinventing Ethan Allen, let we, the first thing I, let me go back into this one, was uh, that Ethan Allen's uh, retail was run by Ethan Allen licensees, all families. And two of them are here, Ken uh, Bloomfield, Ken and Steve, where are you, Steve Fretwell? Ken and his family have been with Ethan Allen for 41 years. Steve, 35 years. And it just so happens, Ken, that it was 30 years exactly in here, your parents, I met them and all the Ethan Allen people here to start the reinvention of Ethan Allen. It was in San Francisco. His, his father and mother, great retailers, along with everybody in the West Coast, I met them somewhere in San Francisco, which started two things. They started the reinvention of Ethan Allen and also started the process I asked them I told them that I'd like to meet with you, but not in cities. I want to meet with some natural places in the West. So twice a year, for about 10, 15 years, we went to every beautiful place we can think in the West. And the West is fantastic and great. But it also helped us start the process of reinvention. Now, when you start a process of reinvention, one of the things I first said, I always felt that you have to do it under some leaders, some principles. So we established at that time, I thought about it, and established what 10 leadership principles. Now, if you, I'll, I don't know if you can read them, but basically they're, they're very simple, they're straightforward. Uh, leadership provide by example, be accessible. Of course, customer focus. Be always focus on excellence and innovation. Have the self-confidence to empower others. Understand that change means opportunity, speed, maintain a competitive advantage, work hard, and practice cons consistently. Prioritize 
established prior, priorities by clearly differentiating between the big issues and the small ones, and finally, which people don't use in business in our concept of justice. Always make decisions fairly. That justice builds confidence and trust, which in turn encourages motivation and teamwork. Now, we have uh, at Ethan Allen, we use this consistently. In fact, uh, for the last 25 years, most of the time, our senior management has to write a self-assessment of how they are following these principles. In fact, they're part of the incentive bonus depends upon the fact uh, when we look at it to see they are doing it. Similarly, our management, our leadership, and I'm happy that m most of the leadership here from this um, greater San Francisco area here, they follow it. They understand that treating people fairly that is important, that uh, in this world, and of course my, his, my background also played a role in that, that m most people are, do not do well because if they feel they've been treated unfairly. So that is in every element. So that became a very important part. Now briefly, when we, Ethan Allen, as I said, was established in the 1930s, it, manif it became a, a manufacturer of what's, early, what's called early American and colonial furniture, was an iconic brand, was very well known, and for um, right up to the 1960s, that was what most 85% of Americans purchased. And in the 1960s to 80s, Ethan Allen, which was uh, distributing its products through um, large, large department stores, furniture stores, gave it up and started to get families like the Bloomfields and, uh, and many, many others to join us. And uh, by the 1970s, we had about 250 Ethan Allen galleries around the country operated by the families. And that's when I got around. But by the 1980s, we had to make some changes. It, all these 250 galleries, represented by about 150 families, all basically had their own marketing programs. So our challenge was, and I got them together, this is when I got involved and became a president, and in fact, in, one, in, 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 the, in, the, in the middle, mid 80s, we got them all together, and I continued to use one message, which was Benjamin Franklin's, that is, Speaking, we said, if we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. You know, this was when they had signed the Declaration of Independence. They were, it was treason, so they all were going to be hanged. So this is what he said to all the folks who had signed the Declaration of Independence. That became a motto. First, many of our Ethan Allen family retail says, crazy, what are you trying to do? We like to do things on our own. But the good news is we did a lot of things, but in four or five years, we had created a national network where practically everybody spoke with one voice. But then comes in the 1990s, we had to again reinvent Ethan Allen right up to the 1980s was predominantly early American colonial. And by 1990s, in early 1990s, we had to change the design of our stores. We had to change about half of our product lines and we introduced it. Fortunately, it became successful at the same time as Ankana mentioned. We had an opportunity to take Ethan Allen private in a management buyout kept it private for four years, and in 1993, exactly 20 years and back, we took it public again. We are now a public company on the New York Stock Exchange. 2000s, we were impacted by globalization and commoditization. By the late, in the 1990s, 70% of furniture was made in the United States. 12 years later, 70% was made offshore. So we were a major manufacturer. We had 31 plants in the United States, from Maine to California. So we now had to confront, well, how do we confront the situation? What do we do? So we had to make, again, reinvent, and look at how do we compete with countries that uh, only a few years back were not able to make things, like China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, and others. Then we did, and I'll talk briefly about it, but then comes the Great Recession. And the Great Recession did impact our industry and others. We lost more business in two years than we had done in 80 years before that. And however, in the last few years, through many changes, we are, we are coming back. We took our 31 manufacturing plants and converted them in, and established into eight. Two new ones we added, one in Mexico, one in Honduras. And you know, we have a manufacturing plants and Maiden is in North Carolina, it is, uh, 
makes a lot of our sofas and chairs and Passaic, New Jersey, which makes our lighting and our wall decor and framing. We, Beecher Falls, North, uh, it's actually Vermont, is our largest sawmill wood processing because we go right from the lumber, trees to making the products and we make all different kinds of products. Orleans, Vermont. Then in Old Fort, North Carolina, we have another major plant in Honduras about a year and a half back. We set up a facility which we're just getting ready. In Mexico, we bought a small operation, but now we have 700 people, state of the art. And now 70% of all our products we make ourselves in North America. We also have now 300 uh, retail uh, worldwide, uh, 200 of them in North America and 100 outside North America. Uh, and the, um, the major change took place in the last 15, 20 years. Many of the families that, uh, that we have, like the Fretwells and the Bloomfields, they, are, they have second generation, so they are operating it, but many didn't have it. So we had to take it over, and in the last 15 years, the challenge was who's going to run them? How do we manage them? So we decided that we would create a core of people to run them, and basically they would be interior designers turned into managers. Practically all our management that is sitting here were interior designers. Now we have 200 leaders who, who were in the, in the last 10, 15 years came from interior designers to run the business, the business. Because the principle is you've got to have people who have passion for what they do. When you have people who have passion, our job was to make them into business managers. Now they can talk about margins and benchmarks and everything else as if they've gone through a high school of business and finance. So we went through our own MBA program with, with them, and uh, they've done an amazing job. Briefly about China, you know, I, in the 1970s, the when I was, went to Italy, I went to India, I went to many places, and I went to China. I wanted to know what China was about, and started doing business, and China was a different place. You know, uh, so I made great friends. And of course, as you can see, uh, the China, in terms of the, the systems, the people, of course, everybody was dressed either in blues or the, or the greys, and, uh, and transportation system was a disaster. Here I was going to the Great Wall and we ran out of gas, so we had to siphon it off a bus. That's what we are doing. Well, but uh, the amazing thing about China is how far they progressed. And I saw that, I witnessed it, and this is our partner in China, uh, where now we have 65 locations in China. And this is the one that we just opened up about a year, year and a half back in, in Guangzhou, which used to be Canton. I used to go to Canton. And uh, now we are, you know, of course, and it's an amazing, I mean, amazing story of China, you all know. Uh, but we have participated in that. We have 65 locations all over China. Then uh, I also, of course, maintain my interest in mountains and Kashmir. Uh, one of the jobs I got initially on Wall Street was I said extracurricular activity. I said mountain hiking. Well, the, you know, we had, um, hiking was our backyard. So I got the job because the personal director was a hiker. Uh, so I maintain hiking because mountains are a great teacher. Mountains teach you to pace yourself. If you go too fast, you come, back, you come down. Nothing wrong in coming down. Most people in business don't like to come down in the world. You stabilize. Uh, I've got a great, I didn't mention it when I was talking about my farm, the two great farmers who owned it and continued to work with me, they taught me that we had apples, we have an apple farm. They said every apple tree needs to be pruned. But if you prune it too much, you can kill it. So these are principles of life. That is, don't, every, we need to prune, but don't overdo it. Mountain teaches you, if you go too high, come down. Stabilize and go back. Uh, my wife, she is actually in Kashmir uh, to, uh, this week, so she sort of also used to travel with me. This is Kilimanjaro, so I had an opportunity of getting up there without oxygen. So mountain, and then also fishing. I, I like some fishing, so this is a pretty good fish up in the Pacific uh, near, near, uh, near uh, British Columbia and Alaska, so for 8, 10, 12 years, gave an opportunity. Then comes 1990 and great trouble in Kashmir. We, it broke, all, all hell broke loose, lots of problems. So we, of course, being from, having lots of connections, the first thing was to see how, if we could help get people work together. So I was involved with establishing a committee we called for Solidarity in Kashmir in 1990 with a Kashmiri uh, Hindu with Christian Ban and most of the people signed and said, you know, we want to work together. 
because everything over there was being done to break people apart. Tremendous suffering for all people. Muslims, Hindus, a tremendous disaster. Uh, at last, unfortunately, things had gotten very, very bad. People were not even working together. And so we tried, we worked at it, and it did not work. Then in 1994, I was invited by the Indian government to come to Kashmir to meet the people. At that time, it was chaos. Some of the leaders or opposition leaders were all in jails. Uh, so I had an opportunity. They asked me to go and meet with them, and which I did, and found out. And then I went to Pakistan also, and found out neither in India or Pakistan in the Kashmir, all these leaders were realistic. They had paradigms of the past that if they continue to do what they were doing, all it would mean is more trouble. So realize that if we don't change the paradigms, don't help shape the debate, they're going to keep on suffering. So with that in mind, I was able, and I realized that I cannot do it individually. So in 1996, I was able to co-found the Kashmir Study Group. In fact, uh, got 24 members who joined, scholars, former diplomats, scholars, think tank presidents, and even uh, initially three members of Congress. One of them was a, co was, co was a chair of the India Caucus, one was chair of the Pakistan Caucus, and one was somewhat independent. And we set it up, and because I realized as a marketing person that if you had, want to do something, you've got to create a brand. And a brand has to be known and it has to be desired. So we wanted to set up a brand for Kashmir. We called it Kashmir Study Group. And there's a history to that, but that's another story. But Kashmir Study Group, the objective was to help shape the debate and have people start thinking about in three terms that we used. And use it, a, you know, I know this that we spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars over there for a lot of years about advertising. And if you don't, in 15 seconds, get your message across, you wasted your resources. So in a conflict like this, which I think applies to a lot of conflicts, we said in our discussions that we are going to press that the, the, the resolution of Kashmir should be peaceful, it should be perceived as honorable, and it should be feasible. So it was under that umbrella we started having discussions. And then we also realized that if we set up this body, we had to that body being recognized. So these were some of the members, or former diplomats, sec you know, deputy secretaries of states and others who joined, 24 of them. In 1996, we, uh, we formed it. Then the next year, in 1997, we sent a uh, ten of them, these members, decided to go to India, Pakistan, the Kashmir region to start establishing the body. Because if you set something up, it's got to be known. It has got to be also be at least uh, received well, be, be positive. So that is where the desire comes in. Uh, so they came back and wrote about a 150-page uh, study, which is it says the Kashmir dispute at 50. And basically, the objective really was to list all the things that people were talking about, not coming with solutions, but giving ideas. And that actually, interestingly, in a year later, led to both the Indians and the Pakistanis to reach us and said, we would like you to have what, was, what they call uh, back-channel diplomacy. And both of them sent two members, very senior members, and they came to our farm in Livingston, New York. And in 1998, through a, uh, a lot of work, came to what's called the Livingston Proposal. It's KashmirStudyGroup.org. It's, you know, it's all, you can take a look at it. But basically, it started talking about this peaceful, honorable, and feasible. That's constantly. And then the, 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 after that, the Indian government invited me to come to India to meet in people in Kashmir all, and talk about it, which was very important because you know, if the India is not interested, well, not much can happen. So they were very much interested. And as you're about to do it and get moving and are about to go to Pakistan, you may, some of you know it, the, the next year the Kargil situation took place, which sort of to some degree derailed it. But we continued uh, to develop uh, the, um, the initiatives. And after discussions, and in fact in 2003, they had a ceasefire, because they were fighting and ceasefire took place. And the Indian prime minister, the Pakistani president, uh, met and then finally both the governments organized and allowed for the first time in 50 years for the Kashmir region people to meet in Nepal in Kathmandu. People who had not spoken or met for 50 years on both sides. They get, I had an opportunity, they had asked me to moderate it, which I did. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that every, 
it's amazing how if you keep on pushing, peaceful, honorable, and feasible, feasibility is important because people have ideas, you know, they have grave, grave re, uh, emotions that they want certain thing to happen, but the question is, is it feasible? If it's not feasible, all you're asking for is trouble. And we have a lot of problems in the world that follow into that. To get that message across, and I had to talk to all kinds of people, people from the left, the right, the militants, and from the religious right to the left and right wings. And, but everybody said yes, they had different ideas. And we kept on, and in fact, they were almost going to, you know, both India and Pakistan had somewhat agreed to it, but again, India and Pakistan, a lot of things happen, politics comes in, if an election is one country, all of a sudden they change their priorities. But anyway, the framework of what we had done was being discussed and still being discussed, even though, you know, they are not. The other thing we did was, to help shape the debate, uh, we got involved and I got involved in developing some studies on the one, one of the major ones was economics as a peace building in Kashmir. Because all, all the leaders, then none of them were talking about economics. They were never talking about how things have got to be improved. All were talking about is conflict, yet the condition of the majority of the people was terrible and suffering. So we're trying to debate, to put into this concept the fact that we have to talk about and then finally, even in 2011, we even gave some ideas again at the request of the governments, especially India, because in 2010, some of you may know Kashmir had lots of problems again. And so, so in any way, uh, the objective really was to help shape the debate. End of the day, they have got to do it. All we can do is help them. If they cannot, they, if they don't want to do it or cannot do it, there's not much one can do. Uh, then I got also involved with refugees. This Richard Holbrook was chairing Refugees International. I took, him, took it over from him in early 2000s. So I was chairing it for six years. Spent a lot of time because they're all interconnected. Uh, the question of refugees, the question of what happened in Kashmir, what happened in other areas. So I spent a great deal of time. That's Matt Dillon too. He's also, uh, he's also on the board. <laughs> and then comes September 2011. 2001, I mean. I mean, again, it really impacted everybody. It's changed the world. And here we were, we said, what do we do? So I've had an opportunity of getting across to the leadership in White House, and I went there, saw them, and in fact, even took two full-page ads, one in the New York Times and one in the Washington Post, because I was very concerned. I, my message was, these hijackers, treat them as criminals. Don't make it into a war, because criminals, the whole world will support it. But if not, religion comes in. And it's very hard. Unfortunately, they didn't listen. They did not treat them as criminals. My even suggestion was have the widows of the people who have lost their lives raise the money for a bounty. Don't put $20 million bounty. Put $5,000 as bounty. Make it as these criminals have done it. And unfortunately, uh, it didn't happen. My, my concern was always, still is, that, you know, if at that time, if we didn't manage it, certainly we, uh, national security is important, but the rights of individuals are important. It's very easy one can lose that. And unfortunately, to a great degree, that's, that's happened. It's a big, big challenge. So with that, it had an implication. So I was involved right after that. Uh, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs asked me to co-chair a task force with Lynn Martin. She was a Secretary of Labor under Bush one and uh, a member of Congress for many years. I had to spend a year and a half on the question about, and this report is of course on public, and, uh, and the issue, the, the task force was strengthening America, the civic and political integration of Muslim Americans. Big issue. We spent uh, two years. They didn't tell me that I had to go to Chicago every month for a year and a half, but you know, I, I was in it. And so came with the reports and uh, uh, went to Congress and, and uh, administration, a lot of other people to see what we can do. And that got me involved with religions, the last thing I wanted to do. So I, I was involved now meeting all kinds of religious leaders all over the world, talking about peace. And um, this is most probably somewhere either in, in, um, uh, in Turkey or the Vatican. Yep, there's a good-looking person there. So, 
And so just all religions of all kinds. Here, as you can see, uh, we, were in, we, were, we went to Kyoto, we went to Jerusalem, we went to Istanbul, to Vatican, and other places to talk about it. I think this is the Vatican. This is uh, the Orthodox Patriarch in Istanbul. And then Afghanistan comes. And you know, I've, we have, I have a sort of um, interest in Afghanistan. I've gone there four or five times, personal reasons, personally, as well as in the administration has asked me to go. And what a disaster. It's sort of a mind-boggling thing. In fact, once I had to walk ar around, they have a check post on the border between Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan, which said you can't enter without a visa, but 20 feet, uh, 20 feet away, you just walk across. So, you know, it's, it's entirely different. This is really, and these are containers coming in without paying any duties. Terrible disaster, and uh, this is before the Taliban. And I had an opportunity of meeting the leadership over there many times. And this is a lady who is the opposition, is a member of parliament in, in Afghanistan. And um, I then also spent time with the US military going into various places and meeting. And uh, this is an Afghan, this is Helmand Provis, is the Afghan general. And interestingly, all I was meeting with him, talking about all kinds of things, and he threw an interpreter. He said, would it be possible for you to help us with Ethan Allen in our new guest house? I said, how do you know about Ethan Allen? I mean, amazing. I said, how? Well, he said one of his aides had been living in Virginia who had gone back, so he knew Ethan Allen. So the question really is, how do you shape the debate? I've, come, I've gone to Afghanistan four times, and come last was last year. I was asked to go this year. But the objective really was to see how do we disengage? I had an opportunity of also being spending some time in Bahrain last year when they had these problems, as you know, Shia, Sunni, of looking at it, trying to see what can, what, uh, what perspectives we can give, listen to them, and unfortunately, uh, the problems of the world are such that, you know, the leaders, the leaders, so-called leaders, for them, power is more important, unfortunately, than r resolving. Uh, this conflict and dispute. Now to get involved, to shape the debate, you also have to meet the right people, always, right? You've got to make sure you're right there. So I've had an opportunity of inter interacting with every secretary of state. Um, Madeleine Albright was special because her father, Joseph Corbell, was uh, given the job to be the plebiscite administrator in Kashmir. Yeah. So he also wrote a book called Danger in Kashmir. So she's sort of somewhat connected. So she always used to meet me about Kashmir because of her background. And President Bush, I had an opportunity of meeting him a few times. And in fact, uh, this is the Indian prime minister and his wife. And I, recently, I also had an opportunity with President Obama when they had interacted. This is President Musharraf. And it's amazing. Now he's in house arrest. So you know, it's amazing what can happen there. This is uh, the, the US government. I've spent, a, I've spent more time, and of course, in the last few years with President Obama. He had asked me to join a, a presidential commission for the last three years. And, and my, our term ends on September 30th, one more, one more, few more days to go. So an opportunity of interacting with him on many subjects of uh, whether it's immigration or other things, or even some of these conflicts we are talking about. I've got also involved with, which I believe is important, is the U.S. Institute of Peace. The U.S. Institute of Peace is one of the institutions supported by the U.S. government, which is trying to work on peace rather than war. So I thought it was a good, good, good institution to support, so I'm an advisory council and a member of this institution. Then we go back to the conflicts of the world, the International Rescue Committee. Today, when you look at with over 20 million people displaced internally, externally, it's a disaster. We look at Syria, and um, uh, it's mind-boggling of what is taking place. I'm involved with the, uh, this organization, uh, still with Refugees International. And then go back to Ethan Allen, the Great Recession. As, uh, as we said, crisis creates an opportunity. We had to stay. The question we asked ourselves, which is really relevant to everybody, is are we relevant? We've been 80 years, but I said, are we relevant? Are we relevant in our offerings, in our message? In, we have an interior design structure of 2,000 associates. We have, uh, are we relevant in technology? Are we relevant in the vertical integration? And we are. So right now, the good news is next month, we are launching, uh, rebranding Ethan Allen under the new eclecticism. So you're going to see a lot of this, and all of this by another two weeks, all of our 
the stores, design centers are going to be turned into this. So everybody is busy converting 200 of them into this projection. And a lot of advertising is following it because we have to stay relevant. Uh, <clears throat> service, we differentiate ourselves with service, uh, with the interior designers that we have. It's really, a, they're great entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a great quality, 70% we make ourselves. It's very unique in this world. And then, very importantly, we are very much conscious and responsible and environmental. We have received a lot of awards from the EPA, from, Connecticut, from Vermont, and, uh, and I think that we are very proud of the fact that we do that because today, you know, environmental responsibility is, very, is critical. Three uh, weeks back, last month, I was um, invited to speak at Ethan Allen, the Patriot. I know how many of you know that Ethan Allen was a, a, Ethan Allen fought along with George Washington against the British, and he is responsible for creating the state of Vermont. This is where he lived, 500 square feet, with six children. So I was invited to speak at his 275th birthday in Vermont. And go back to the leadership principles, because that's what guides us. That's what makes it possible for us to, to motivate, to get involved with all kinds of things, and especially, as I said, finally, this concept of justice means not giving things away. It's tough to be, to, 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 uh, to, be, ju to be just. And with that, I think I'd just like to open it up for any questions that you might have. Looks like there's a microphone up here. And, and hey, you, Mr. Kadwari, thanks for such a great speech. How about telling us who you are and you know, so that sure. everybody knows? So I am a part-time MBA student here right. at Haas School of Business. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. So my question is, <clears throat> since we are in business school, right? So what innovative steps can business schools take to alleviate the increasing income gap? And the second part is, how should businesses and leaders think about social capital? Yeah. I think this question I was talking with Dr. Nora Silva earlier, I think that the great strength of America especially was the middle class. That's, and today we see tremendous issues of the middle class. People, that unemployment and unemployment is going to it uh, uh, looks like going to stay there because we got structural issues. Uh, on the other hand, we also have this tremendous difference of incomes arising. I think the first thing is, it is being discussed. There's a lot of discussion going on right now, which is good. Uh, second, I think is that business schools and others have to teach students that while money is important, that's not the only thing in life. I was sharing um, also with Dr. Silver that at Ethan Allen, we, our biggest award we give is called the Golden Kite Award. It's after a kite. And the principle is, those who have flown the kite high and with humility, the tail follows. For us, the tail is the money. So if, if the tail, if, if all you're thinking of is the tail to go up, the generally we create the kind of problems we have. So I think there's a big debate uh, so it started, but more has to take place about this, not only the income differences, but more importantly, how uh, middle class people be making more money than working at the bottom end have to take place. And uh, it's a big issue. I don't think we have that many answers. Uh, one thing good is that, you know, so at least little, uh, the manufacturing has started to come back. That was the base to some degree. And I think that uh, more of that is going to come back, even though a lot of that is automated, because the labor costs are high, our medical costs are a disaster. We've got structural problems. One of the big problems we have is medical costs in this country. We have operations in Mexico and Honduras, and our medical costs are twice as much as the wages and employees in Mexico. But think of it, when you are making a decision, what would you do? So I'm just talking of one example. So I, we have lots and lots of issues, lots of, and I, it's not being discussed. So I don't, really don't have an answer other than the fact that 
uh, in business schools. I think it's important for to discuss that making money is important, especially here in the Silicon Valley. Everybody wants to be, become an internet uh, entrepreneur and a millionaire pretty fast, which is good, nothing, nothing wrong with it. But I think uh, we have to, to some degree, take the responsibility of creating business leaders who will think more than just the question of making money any possible way. Yeah, good evening and thank you for coming here. Uh, my question is, uh, my name is uh, Pujan Binder from a city called Stockton, uh, about 70 miles from here. Um, the current administration, they have a health initiative commonly called the Obamacare and people are very confused and truly business uh, men, uh, business people are cutting down hours to make sure they don't have to pay the, uh, uh, the health care costs. A lot of confusion out there. By and large, how sh if, you, if you listen to the president, he said the best thing in the world. If you listen to all other experts, they say the worst thing in the world. So how, how, what do you think about it and how can we figure out well, what, what is the right medium in all this? No, it's, a, it's a big issue. You know, we have 5,000 mostly full-time people in the United States. Now, every one of them, or most of them, we have to pay medical for them and their families. It's a big, big challenge. Now, paying for it is okay. I think one of the things that is being missing in this whole equation is how do we c contain medical costs. I think that is not being discussed. I think covering people for the insurance, providing them, we have to do it. I mean, we are an advanced, only developed country in the world which does not have the ability to take care of its people, or all its people. So I think that uh, certainly one part of it is making, uh, getting everybody insurance. The second cost is who's going to pay for it, and what, how, how much has to be paid for it. There, that's where the issue is. I think, uh, from my perspective, the president could, should, could have and should do a much better job in explaining to everybody where, what, this, uh, what this medical care is about. Because people are confused. Even we as business leaders completely don't know. Now, we know, for instance, that uh, it is going to, uh, as soon as we start also covering the younger people who are still living at home, is going to increase our coverage. So we are starting to look at how much of this should be shared by employees. We are taking a look at a number of health plans whereby if you are, li if you are living more healthy, you are, have a lower premium than others. We are doing all those kinds of things. But I think we have in this country a major structural problem, both in education and health. As I said, when I went to school, my to total fear, that's not that many years back, my total 12 credits at NYU was $600 a quarter, a semester. Can you imagine that? Now I think it must be $30,000. Ridiculous. Similarly, the medical cost has gone way out. I think those two major, there are two major fundamental things that we've got to do in the country to improve the welfare of the people. Make education, good education available. And secondly, uh, uh, reduces health costs. Uh, if we don't reduce the health costs, you're going to end up this question earlier about the fact of jobs. Come, people are saying, why should we have jobs here? Because end of the day, it's nice to say, we are keeping jobs in the United States. 60% of what we sell in China, we ship from the United States. 60% we're shipping from the US. But we are, and I've said this publicly, our margins are half lower than half of making in the United States than we could have made elsewhere. But we're still doing it because I think longer term, it'd be good for us to keep manufacturing because once we give it up, hard to get it back. So we, are, we think long term, but if we were thinking like everybody else, and keep in mind that we have a public company, and if uh, the public company, um, we, you know, they don't, they, they, uh, Wall Street does not care about all the things I'm talking about. 
they'll say, why don't you just get rid of all of this stuff? We are not. Fortunately, we have the ability to maintain it and still be profitable and all of that. But these are big, big issues, and I think a lot of discussion needs to take place. No, no easy answers. We are also confused. Uh, Mr. Kathwari, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm in the impact investing class. We've got to decide where to put $100,000 uh, into a social enterprise. And I noticed that you spend most of your time and energy and perhaps money on advocacy and political engagement at the highest levels. So my question is, how do you decide where to spend your, your time and energy? Uh, and why are you not focused on, on other areas of, of help, like building schools or you know, other things that you could be doing? Why do you decide to focus on advocacy? Yes, um, I think that um, certainly my background plays a role in that. I've been, I've, I've seen conflict. I've seen, um, you know, we were refugees. So I know those things I know. I can relate to them and I cannot be everywhere. And it's not possible. So got to select some areas where you can make a contribution. And that's, so that's a reason we do it because I know we cannot be all over the place. There are a lot of other people who can do those things. Even the things that I'm doing is, you know, it's still relatively small. I do not know how much of impact it makes. But uh, that's what we are doing now. In other ways, we are making some impacts. We are, in small ways, I didn't talk about it. Personally, I'm uh, in, involved with, for instance, giving scholarships to some of the, some of the we, we have a university in Connecticut. I'm involved with that. So we're involved with those areas, number of those areas. Didn't talk about it, but main focus has been because could potentially make an impact. Good evening, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm George Scharfenberger. I run a master's in development practice program here at the university and work on international experiential learning programs at Haas. Um, I guess a two-part question. How, how does Ethan Allen, not yourself, but how does Ethan Allen define its relationships and responsibilities to the communities where it operates? And, and concretely, how does it manifest itself in Pasaic as opposed to Honduras? And if it's different, why? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, this whole question about social responsibility question is how what should corporations do? I've had a number of, I've been involved in many discussions and my perspective is for us that we better focus on things that we can do something about. First is our biggest uh, base out there is our customers. We got to treat them fairly. We got to give them the best quality, best service. So we, every year we say, are we doing it better? So that's one important, because they are tremendously important. The second is our own employees, whether in the United States or Mexico. I was um, uh, earlier discussing with Dr. Silva that when we opened up an operation in Mexico five years back, we bought a small little place with about 70, 80 people. Now we have 750 there. We expanded a lot, a lot of technology. But we said, let's in Mexico, this is central Mexico in a state called Guanajuato, we said, let's have the same environmental and safety standards as we have in Vermont, which is pretty tough. First was, why should we do it? Then we said, no, let's do it, because we should treat the people with the same dignity as we do people. And at the end of the day, it's going to benefit us, because when people know they're treated well, they're treated with dignity, they're going to do well. And one of the best investments we made. So in Honduras, we do the same thing. We are not required to. In uh, Vermont, for instance, we have a lot of communities. We are in the Northeast Vermont, uh, also known as the Northeast Kingdom, which is really, you know, pretty far, even from Burlington, Vermont, which is sort of where a lot of folks live, to get into North. That's where we are. And we have great people over there, a lot of resources. In fact, when I first got involved, uh, you know, I had, we had a president who was, uh, from, who was from the New England, a great Yankee. He took me there. There were 2,000 Green Mountain boys looking and men, boy, girls and boy, looking at me. Who's this person named Farouk? He's going to be the CEO. And so they're looking and I sort of, I said to them, I said, you know, we have a lot of common where I grew up. 
First, our mountains are higher, so I can't say that, you know, <laughs> what you have over there in Kashmir is a valley. However, I grant you, you have mountains. The second thing is, I grew up with a saying, we have a common saying, that most of the problems of the world have been created by flatlanders. <laughs> they all raise their hands and say, great, you are one of us. In Vermont, we, for instance, are involved with the communities. We have helped the fire department, the school, because you know, we are the biggest taxpayer too. So if, whether we do it directly or indirectly. The next thing we ever did, which was very important because Vermont in the winter can go minus 40. You folks in San Francisco don't know what that is. <laughs> minus 40. So we, over the years, have, just, have used a lot of uh, wood waste. And this year, for the first time, we are burning zero oil. We are creating our own steam, creating heat, creating electricity. We've got steam engines that go back to the, you know, it's 100 years old, those steam engines. So we are very deeply involved in the communities we are in, whether it's manufacturing and also where we are involved with, uh, for instance, you know, we were unfortunately in uh, Danbury, Newtown, that's where headquarters is. We were at a great disaster last year with the Sandy Hook. So we are, we're right into it. So we got involved as much as we could. So, but I think getting involved with our, with our clients, getting involved with our employees, and getting involved with our, uh, our communities and all the people who are our suppliers. You know, we do a lot of business in places like India, for instance. I used to spend a lot of time. Well, if you don't give them the right money, they're going to cut down, they're going to do all kinds of things. So we said, let's treat them fairly. The reason we can do it is this. We are a little bit lucky that we have a vertically integrated company. From the concept of an idea, to engineering, to design, to manufacturing, to marketing, we run our own retail network. If we didn't, and I had to sell the product to some of these to stores, they don't care about quality. They would not care about what we do in India or China or Malaysia. We can, fortunately, through our vertical integration, have, a great, have, have, have an impact. Anybody from Ethan Allen want to say something? Ken, what is? <laughs> or David, go ahead. Come tell them a little bit about it because. Come up to the mic. Come up to. No. <laughs> I've been with Ethan Allen for 40 years. That's all. Just 40 years. Okay. Yeah. I'm only 37. And <laughs> yeah. I don't have it. <laughs> Having uh, been the third generation in my family in the furniture business, I can tell you that having uh, dealt with <clears throat> the usual kind of uh, ma manufacturers that there are, that uh, uh, partnering, and that's really what it is, partnering with Ethan Allen is really unlike anything else because of everything that Farouk has said, uh, really he inspires us to do the same thing on a local level, even though we're just a, a small retailer in, uh, in San Jose, in my case. Um, so it really is a different way of looking at business. Um, a lot of what he says really uh, has affected the way we look at things. Um, it's just a much better way of doing business. I really don't know what else to say about that. I do have a question for you, though. For oh, you do? Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> this industry has been built, as far as I can tell, on baby boomers. And the whole generation that has really built up this industry. In most of the industries that we know today, except for the new um, electronics industry. And I know you were talking a lot about how do you basically change the whole business, the way of doing business, to attract, well, the folks in this room, for example, and the Gen X, the millennials, and things like that. Because it's, it seems to me that it's a whole different way of uh, doing business on their part. So what are we doing about that? <laughs> <clears throat> Well, you're going to come to Danbury in November, aren't you? We have a conference. Well, I think it's a very important question. What really is happening is the cycle of reinvention is becoming shorter and shorter. We could afford to reinvent things five years, 10 years, but not anymore. Technology is changing our lives. 
the impact of the Gen Xers in terms of their information, their knowledge, it is changing. Their taste levels are different in the sense they're much more eclectic. They're very happy to get products at all different levels of quality. That is not what the baby boomer generation that we were used to when they said we're Ethan Allen customer, everything was Ethan Allen, not anymore. So we, are, we have to address that. We are addressing it in terms of all elements. We have spent a great deal of time. In fact, um, as you know, we are launching this whole, uh, what we call eclecticism. We have developed uh, lots of products. Color is important. Uh, design is important. We've gone from being traditional to also contemporary, and you're going to see more of that. And um, while we want to maintain our baby boomers, we also want to expand our reach to the, the Gen Xers which is really, for us, that means people in the mid-30s and up. I mean, at this stage, for us to go into 20s is not something that is, a, is, a, is, is something that is tremendously viable. But 30s and up, we should be doing it through our electronic media, through our digital media, through the product programs. And as you know, we have launched, for instance, this month, we just sent out 5.3 million copies of our magazine, and half of them were Gen Xers. And we're going to send six million copies in October and November. Half of them are, so we've got to reach them. But we've got, when we reach them, we've got to make sure when they come in, we have the products that they also like and aspire. So we are working on that, and I think that is very, very important. But uh, if, we, if not, we're going to be left out. Well, there's one more question coming up. Hi. Um, I'm a part-time MBA student at uh, Haas. Um, so in conflict areas, there is, of course, the issue of resolving the conflict itself. And then comes the rebuilding phase. Um, and there are bound to be competing priorities there. Um, how would one go about prioritizing? Would you go for the one with the maximum impact? Would you go for one with uh, the low-hanging fruit? It's a good question. You know, this is always a question from, of when you have major national disasters where you say, OK, how the first job is to really make sure you take care of the people who are affected by the disaster. You got to protect them, you got to give them, feed them, you got to give, make sure that they don't freeze. And then you start thinking about how do, you, how do you rebuild. And rebuilding is very, very important. They both are important, they both have to come uh, uh, side by side, but certainly the first one becomes critical if you have a national disaster. Now, there is a national disaster in many of these societies you're talking about. You have, on one hand, lots and lots of people who are on the ground who don't have food, don't have shelter. And, and on the other hand, you want to help them build it. Uh, I think that a lot of this, to a great degree, rests on the leadership in those areas. And I, we, we've got to encourage these leaders to see these people who are in need. What happens, unfortunately, is that uh, many times the folks who are, can make an impact don't see. Many, many of the poor countries, the people who are well-to-do don't even see poor people, even though they're right next door on the street. They don't see them. So I think that the people, the leaders, the leadership have to help shape it. We can help from the outside, but I don't think long-term that is a... That's a viable thing. It really is he shaping, helping shape the debate. I think that's where younger generations should come in, not tolerate, in my view, the leaders in many of these countries who basically live in the past. They made it into a business to maintain the status quo. Uh, they should be challenged. And uh, without that, in my view, it's not, going to not, it's not going to change if the people in the regions where they're affected don't change through their own leaders. Otherwise, you do it from the outside, the, the, and we have seen this, the amount of money that is wasted, corrupted, goes to all different sources. You, you see it all over the place. So changing this paradigms of the leadership in the region, not accepting them, I think has to, and this has to be, because in my view, a lot of people in these countries are motivated to, to go up, protest to the benefit of these so-called leaders, not, not for their own benefits. How do you help shape the debate? Uh, that has to be done internally and externally, in my view, otherwise not going to make a difference. I think uh, 
we have, that was most probably the last. And again, I want to, Dr. Silva, thank you. It's a great opportunity to be here. And Ankana, again, thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. And uh, really good to be here and to share some thoughts. Mr. Katwari for spending the day with us and I want to share with you a couple of things that I take away from spending a day with you. Um, one is to never forget that what we're all looking for and what we all deserve is a sense of dignity, of being seen, of being treated fairly, of um, being treated justly. Another topic that came up earlier today, not so much tonight, I do want to I do want to raise. And one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of what Mr. Katwari has talked about in his leadership is that one reason it seems to me he can make the kinds of ethical and important decisions he's made is because he's looking long term. It's not as small as just looking at the quarterly returns. It's more if you're looking at a piece in a region you know, you're not looking for immediate ego gain or acknowledgement or credit. You're looking long term. And to me, in everything he said, I see the difference. If you just shift that lens to look for long term accomplishment or gain rather than short term, and sometime long term even beyond your tenure on earth. Okay. And one lesson I learned tonight was something, another saying from I don't know who wasn't Einstein or Franklin, and anybody can help me if they remember, but it's a saying that if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. And so I especially appreciate it. You're sharing with us some of the times you tried really hard, and it just wasn't there at that time. And I'd like all of us, to, especially our students, to walk away with that lesson, that, that trying, looking long term, and pe keeping, treating people with dignity is what leadership is all about, whether at Ethan Allen, at the, um, at the nonprofit you're involved with, business students, wherever we are, that that's something I will certainly take away. And thank you, Mr. Katwari, for that. Thank you all for coming. There's still some food and the drink in the back. Please help yourselves. <laughs>